NVRTF, National Voting Rights Task Force, Org. And again, this is a virtual who's who of the election integrity movement with uh, very important people in the audience as well. Uh, Paul Thomas, I, I'm going to tell you what I know all, the, all these people for. Uh, Paul Thomas uh, was the man, him and the group he worked with, who brought to the attention uh, of the people of Ohio, including myself, who filed it into the public record in the King Lincoln Brunsville case, that our election system in 2004 was completely privatized, run by private individuals, and they sent the IT guy home, and our supercomputers failed, and thankfully there was a backup uh, plan in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where Jeff Averbeck, a right-wing Pentecostal minister, working closely with Karl Rove, counted our votes and sent them back to Ohio. And on that thing was also every Republican web page in America. It was Paul Thomas and the people that he worked with that found that out uh, for us. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Well, I wanted to make a suggestion about uh, getting funding for the USC, the Coalition for Good Government, uh, make a coalition of att election attorneys from ac across the country ready to roll at election time. Oh, I'm sorry. So that what I just said was for getting funding perhaps for the Coalition for Good Government is to form a coalition, a nationwide coalition of election attorneys that are ready to rock and roll at election time. Okay, so thanks for that great introduction. Uh, I'm coming from a different perspective now. I've done, I've been involved in election integrity for roughly 15 years. Um, but it was in the primaries of 2016 that I found myself uh, being faced with the question uh, of systemic problems. Uh, I was one of the co-founders of Election Justice USA. How's that? Good. All right, so I was one of the founders of uh, Election Justice USA, and we were pursuing legal cases in New York and California and helped John get st rolling in Arizona. Um, but it was that election that proved to me that it brought me back face to face with a, a particular reality, and that was that it's not just that elections can be rigged from cycle to cycle by progr programmatically or by insiders or what have you, but the voting system itself is rigged. Um, and so what I mean by that, it's the, the plurality voting, of course. So it was after, after I got depressed about the 2016 elections and uh, had some time to recover from the intensity of uh, being involved in those legal cases and so on, that I realized that 2016 not only presented that problem very poignantly, but it pr presented a solution as well. And that was in the fact that uh, the state of Maine uh, became the first state in the country to uh, enact uh, a ballot measure that uh, uh, establishes uh, ranked choice voting uh, for all of their federal and state elections. <clears throat> so what I hope to do today is to give, I know probably a lot of you know what RCV is. It's also called instant runoff voting. Uh, but I hope that my talk will give you a, a sense of what the problems are and uh, why we want to make Massachusetts, uh, voter choice Massachusetts, the second state in the country to enact uh, right choice voting as a state level. So, first, uh, next slide, please. Oh. <laughs> Whoops. Jim, do you have that copy that, do you have that copy that I sent you? Oh, oh, that was, that was also a link, okay. Um, so should we take a break and come back to it? All right. Are we ready? All right. Snap back.
to it. There's election fraud to be defeated. All right, we're about to restart. And I blame every small snafu on Karl Rove. It's just habit. <laughs> or the Koch brothers. All right, Paul Thomas uh, will continue with his presentation. If we can get silence. Silence. All right. Come on back in. We're on a tight schedule. Not like elections in Ohio. We don't got three to seven hours to stand in line. All right, Paul Thomas. I need water. I'm back. Okay, so um, if we go to the second slide, I assume you remember everything from the first slide, right? Uh, so I, what I'm going to do is uh, go through who we are as Voter Choice Massachusetts, cover the problem, uh, plurality voting, and some examples of that, uh, and then the solution, ranked choice voting, uh, uh, tell you where ranked choice voting is used around the states and the country, uh, then get into our campaign uh, of on-the-ground on active advocacy. Uh, we're trying to get a, ballot, uh, a measure on the ballot for 2020. Okay, next slide. Voter Choice Massachusetts is a nonpartisan, politically diverse, and nonprofit. We advocate for electoral reforms that uh, increase the range of choice on the ballot and uh, produce fair outcomes for all. Uh, and Voter Choice Massachusetts has, as I said, uh, nonpartisan, but we've got a lot of people who are independents, Republicans, Democrats, uh, Greens, Libertarians, and even some interest from the Pirate Party. So. Uh, next slide. Uh, the problem. Uh, the problem is plurality voting, which is our current system where the person with the most, most vote wins. Um, it's also known as first past the post, winner take all, or uh, I'm fond of lesser evil voting. Why is it a problem? Uh, first of all, any system has strengths and weaknesses, uh, like plurality voting, uh, RCV, uh, they all have strengths weaknesses, but what plurality voting doesn't do is it doesn't ensure a, a winner who represents the majority of the vote. You don't, you need to, uh, you don't have 50% or, or more than 50% of the vote. Um, it often forces voters to choose candidates uh, who they don't, they don't like. Um, it weakens all allied interest bases by vote splitting, um, often produces the spoiler effect uh, that discourages both voters and candidates. And finally, it rewards negative campaigning. So I'll get into a few examples to help illustrate these issues. Uh, next slide. Does anyone remember this? Can anyone forget it? OK. The outcome of this was that Bush beat Gore by four, 537 votes numerically. We'll leave other issues aside for now. Um, next slide. Uh, okay, so that 537 vote difference between Bush and Gore was about 2% of the vote. Um, it made Nader, Ralph Nader, a kingmaker, which means that even though he was the least, uh, po the least popular candidate in the, the lineup, uh, he had the power to decide the race by either staying in it or leaving it. So... So uh, in a minute, we'll see uh, some of the data that supports his role as a spoiler and uh, candidate who effectively si siphoned votes away from Al Gore. Uh, one thing I'd note here is that neither candidate has a majority. None of the candidates have a majority. Okay, next slide. So it was exit polls, exit polls of the uh, Nader voters that, that uh, led us to understand that um, there's that Nader siphoned away uh, almost half of, rather, half of the people who voted for Nader would have voted for Gore. A quarter would have voted for Bush. And then there's even a, almost a quarter that would, didn't, wouldn't vote at all if neither of those two had been in a game, if Nader hadn't been in a game. So um, I think that measures the disaffection of our system. Next slide. 
So when you add it all up, because of the way that we vote, plurality voting, uh, we blame Nader and the people who vote for him uh, for what happened in the year 2000. Whereas if we had a different system, that wouldn't be the case, I think. Next slide. Uh, this is another key example uh, with a three-way primary race that shows the importance of parties being able to pick a strong candidate uh, to go to the general election because uh, Martha Coakley went on to lose the general to our current uh, governor, Charlie Baker. Uh, next slide. So in any event, uh, Martha Coakley was sort of a, a name, name brand, household name, um, sort of mainstream centrist compared to the other two candidates, uh, Steve Grossman and Dan Berwick. Uh, they were deemed to be, or understood to be more on the progressive side of the, the slate, and that will, uh, will show in a couple of quotes coming up. Um, but with 50% of the Democratic vote, obviously the majority interest, the allied interest lined up on that side of the spectrum. So if, if either Grossman or Beckman, Beckwith had stepped out of the race, who knows what the results would have been uh, at the general. Next slide. So I like this slide because what it does is it shows, uh, it, it, uh, shows some of Berwick supporters uh, talking about uh, their choices and in terms, the natural language of ranked choice voting, my choice. Steve Grossman is my strong second choice. I supported Berwick at the convention, but I'm so frightened that Coakley will blow yet another campaign that I'm leaning toward voting Grossman just to block her. I was a strong supporter of Don Berwick and Martha Coakley was my last choice in the Democratic primary. So um, that's the takeaway from that slide. Next slide, please. Uh, this example is a very interesting one to me because in recent years, I think it was 2013, that Boston became a m minority majority city uh, where people of color constitute the majority. And you can see that reflected in the slate of 12 candidates that uh, were, went into the preliminary race. Boston has a, a two round runoff, which means there's a preliminary uh, where uh, the top two candidates that will go into the final are uh, picked. So, so the question is then, how did it turn out to be that two Irish white guys were the top two finalists here? Next slide. And again, the answer is in the splitting of the vote among several strong minority candidates, probably. Uh, that's next slide. With a, a, a crowded field, uh, 12 candidates, that's a lot. Uh, what do I do with my single vote in such a case? Uh, how do I split one vote? So you throw your vote to your favorite candidate and hope for the best. The problem was so bad that supporters of uh, Charlotte Golar Ritchie uh, got out and, and had a meeting or uh, set up a meeting to uh, decide how to get other candidates of color to step out of the race so that Golar Ritchie would be the winner, uh, among the top two at least. The Boston Globe discovered this and editorialized, uh, don't, don't force out black candidates. Next slide. And so it mentions here, uh, with the new Boston and uh, people of color being a 53% majority they wanted to let democracy happen rather than force candidates out of the mix. And this is one of the ever-present uh, anti-democratic problems of our current voting system, plurality voting. Uh, I, w I think we saw that in the 2016 where they didn't want Bernie to be part of that race. Um, just my thinking. So the power interests will always con exert backroom control of who they think should run uh, in the race. I think instead, uh, voting systems should seek to accommodate the kind of diversity that we had in that uh, mayoral uh, can, uh, race, uh, more in diverse interests, and more uh, citizen enthusiasm and involvement. That's the way our voting system should be, I believe. 
Uh, and we know that the top driver of voter turnout is uh, having a good candidate and a good campaign because they'll drive their base and, and their neighbors out. And if you got 12 candidates, the more the merrier. That would be ideal. In plurality voting systems, the paradox is that the more candidates you have, the more each, the presence of each candidate weakens the other candidates. The current ballot system, and that's the current ballot system. A next slide. Okay. I mentioned negative campaigning as uh, something that's endemic to, uh, to plurality voting. And this slide sort of captures the, the Trump-Hillary scenario. Um, but one of the things that negative uh, campaigning doesn't do is allow you to um, s seek your opponent's voters uh, to get them out to vote for you. Uh, plurality voting uh, encourages negative campaigning because vo uh, candidates are, are trained to differentiate themselves by showing their best face, for putting their best foot forward uh, and showing how terrible their uh, opponents are. So you can imagine if you slam your opponent, uh, their, his, their voters are not going to like you very much. So what I'm about to talk about is ranked choice voting. Uh, with ranked choice voting, uh, it encourages uh, actually positive campaigning because uh, what you have to do is go and seek uh, the other candidates uh, second choice the other candidates voters second choices uh, and one one uh, bit of research is that the recent evidence shows that voters in ranked choice voting cities uh, perceive greater civility in the races of their elections as compared to voters in non-ranked choice voting cities. So, I guess next slide. This slide just captures a summary of the data from Massachusetts that shows how non-majority winners uh, is a big problem. I mean, the, there are huge numbers of races in three-way races uh, where the winner walks away with less than 50% of the vote. So they're not representing the majority of the citizens of that uh, jurisdiction. <clears throat> Next slide. So to summarize, the system is spoiled. It fails to guarantee majority winners. Uh, it fails to eliminate the spoiler effect. It discourages candidates from running. Uh, limits our choice in the voting booth and it encourages negative campaigning. So because of this sort of voting, uh, other candidates with new ideas can't come in and inject them into the race because we'll blame them for splitting the vote. Um, and I don't think that voters who like good ideas should be chastised because they voted for, for example, Ralph Nader. So to me, that's very anti-democratic. Next slide. So now I'm going to talk about the solution, which is ranked choice voting. Next slide. It's really a simple thing. Um, you think about what we do every day to make our decisions in, in living life. Um, instead of voting for one candidate, ranked choice voting allows you to vote for multiple candidates in the order that you prefer them. How's that work? Well, you can, next slide, please. Uh, You can, so say you liked candidate number three in this ballot, this example ballot. You would blacken the, the, the bubble f number one in the first column and say you liked candidate one uh, next in, in favoritism. You'd blacken the, their number two uh, bubble and you don't even have to vote for candidate three if you didn't like that person at all. You can leave it blank. So next slide. So I'm going to run a video now uh, that shows how the voting is done sort of in real time. I like the animation of this, uh, this video uh, and shows how the tabulation is done in the response and the, the follow-up. Uh, click on this.
In most elections, you only vote for one candidate for each office. But in some elections, voters can rank three or more candidates for each office. It's called rank choice voting. Here's an example of how it works. All of the candidates will be listed on the ballot in three columns. Make your first choice vote in column one by filling in the oval of the candidate you'd most like to win. Vote for your second choice in column two and make your third choice in column three. That's all there is to it. Now let's see how the votes are counted. It's not let's showing. say there are four candidates running for mayor. Asha, Zach, uh, Omar, and Lucy. Can Once the polls that? close, we count all... Um, try on slide 22, there's a link to this. Try that, see if it'll work. In most elections, you only vote for one candidate for each office. But in some elections, voters can rank three or more candidates for each office. It's called... Yeah. Yeah, on, on, sli on slide 22, there's a YouTube link to that video. That's it. That's it. You might have to copy and paste it into the URL box. Or click maybe with that pop-up. Um, maybe not. In most you elections, go. you only vote for one candidate for each office. But in some elections, voters can rank three or more candidates for each office. It's called rank choice voting. Here's an example of how it works. All of the candidates will be listed on the ballot in three columns. Make your first choice vote in column one by filling in the oval of the candidate you'd most like to win. Vote for your second choice in column two and make your third choice in column three. That's all there is to it. Now let's see how the votes are counted. Let's say there are four candidates running for mayor. Asha, Zach, Omar, and Lucy. Once the polls close, we count all the first choice votes first. To be elected mayor, a candidate needs more than half the votes. In this example, Asha has more than half of the votes, so she's declared the winner. However, if no candidate gets more than half the votes, we start eliminating candidates and counting the next choices of those who voted. In this example, Zach is the candidate with the smallest number of first choice votes, so he is cut. We use the second choice votes on Zach's ballots and count those voters' second choices instead. If one of the remaining candidates now has more than half of the total votes, that candidate is declared the winner. If not, the next lowest candidate, Lucy, is eliminated. Her votes are now counted for the next choice on the ballot. Some of Lucy's votes went to Zach, who was already eliminated, so those new votes for Zach instead count for those voters' third choice candidate. We are now down to two candidates, and Omar clearly has more than half of the votes. That makes him the winner. That's how ranked choice voting works. For more information on ranked choice voting, visit our website. Okay. Um, to, to summarize then, uh, ranked choice voting seeks a majority winner in the first round. If you get a majority winner, the, the race is over. If you don't get a majority winner, then uh, the lowest vote getter is eliminated and you uh, add that person's uh, second choice voters to the appropriate column. And again, assess whether you got a majority after you count those. If you do have a majority, the race is over. If not, you go into a third runoff. And all of this happens in instantly. Next slide, please. So ranked choice voting, the bottom line, allows you to vote for your favorite candidate first, uh, your uh, second favorite second, uh, your third favorite, your fourth, et cetera. And again, you don't have to vote for all the candidates on the list. Okay. Whoops. Okay. Uh, so next slide, please. That's it. Uh, let's see. Next slide, rather. 
Okay, so a couple of hypotheticals. Uh, you can imagine if we were using ranked choice voting in Florida in the 2000 race, Nader voters could have voted for Ralph Nader and made their second choice uh, Al Gore. Uh, next slide. Here's a hypothetical from last year. Uh, Bernie actually could have run as an independent. Okay, thank you. Uh, could have run as an independent and uh, got first choice voters for him and then uh, second choice is going to Hillary. Uh, if you use ranked choice voting in the primary and the Republican side, it may have been that uh, the, the 17 candidates wouldn't have split the votes and uh, left Ralph, uh, left Trump the, the strongest candidate. Okay, skip a couple slides. So here's an example ballot from Minneapolis. Next slide, San Francisco. Uh, and the way you fill these out is close this line. Of course, most of you probably know that, but uh, let's see. So next slide. So what it does, ranked choice voting does, is eliminate spoilers and vote splitting. It encourages more people to run, and you enjoy more positive campaigns because you're seeking second choices of other uh, candidates. It gives voters more choice and more voice, and we hope to transform politics in Massachusetts with this. I guess, uh, let's see. Two slides, three slides on, please. So Maine became the first in 2016 to take this up. Next slide. These are some of the cities that use it in the states. Next slide. Uh, around the world and a, a number of professional and otherwise organizations, including voting for the Academy Awards. Uh, finally, let go to, one, click through if you would. Okay, next slide, that one. Um, our campaign started, uh, it was actually started uh, several years ago by Adam Friedman, who is our executive director, um, but it, it was dormant for a long time. He carried it forward uh, until uh, what happened last year, both, I think, the results of the elections and the fact that Maine uh, voted it in, voted ranked choice voting in. Uh, uh, he started recruiting people from his mailing list, got 54 people to the first uh, meeting, We've got more than 7,000 people interested uh, by now. Uh, we got seven regional chapters. Uh, bottom, the final bottom line, because I'm out of time, uh, is that we've got a timeline. We are originally going to go try and get a ballot measure uh, in place for 2018. Uh, but our polling with the fundraising we did this year showed that if people know what ranked choice voting is, they'll support it. But if they don't, uh, they, it's likely they won't. Um, so what is on our agenda now is a massive uh, get out or support, a grassroots support effort uh, and uh, try and get the measure on the ballot in 2020. Uh, okay, I guess that's it. Uh, questions? Is this so, okay. I wanted to point out that there are other forms of ranked choice voting besides instant runoff voting, for example, border, um, uh, range, and uh, approval voting. Mm -hmm. Border voting works by giving, for example, if you have the top three candidates, you might give your favorite three votes, your second favorite two votes, and your third favorite one vote. Mm -hmm. And then all you have to do is add them up. There's none of this switching candidates around. I was a poll worker in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, when, rank, when instant runoff voting was on the ballot, it was actually defeated. And I was very glad because when I was a poll worker there, they counted all the ballots by hand. Mm -hmm. Because the ballots, in, in, at least in the provincial level, are very simple. All you do is vote for your member of parliament. And in this case, they had to vote yes or no on, on instant runoff voting. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were counted by hand locally. Those numbers were put up for everybody to see and then the numbers were shared. In Canada, at the federal and provincial level, they count ballots locally. It would have been impossible to do local counting of ballots if instant runoff voting had passed in British Columbia because there's no way to determine which ballots get shifted locally. You have to look at the global figures. It's also very hard to uh, audit these, this, this system, whereas with border, it would be relatively easy. There, as I said, there are strengths and weaknesses to all systems. Um, the reason I got involved with this was, A, 
uh, ranked choice voting has a lot of traction uh, around the world and here in the States. Uh, and Matt Maine gave me that, uh, that spark that said, hey, I can do something in a forward-looking way. So that I, I don't have answers to, um, I mean, computers obviously are how you manage. I know, I know. Most of my colleagues here don't like computing your vote. But um, I think if you get good open source technologies in place, uh, that's a possibility, but I, you're obviously disagreeing. <laughs> You cannot count it locally by hand. I mean, that's a fact, and it's really hard to audit. Um, <laughs> David, yeah, that, that's David Corey. David Corey is with the, David Corey is with the Fair 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 Vote in uh, California. There you go. Okay, so you had the two pictures with Bernie and Hillary, and the other one, and then you said that um, with the instant runoff, we would have three choices. Why would we have three choices, two Democratic candidates, and then a, another, because you still have... Well, so you had Donald Trump was the third candidate. Got it. So if he had run, I'm sorry, Thank yes. You. Okay, I missed that part. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, Quickly. Mike Feinstein, Santa Monica. Um, by the way, uh, ranked choice voting got 58% in British Columbia. The premier said it needed 60 to pass. So it was defeated because it was undemocratic and how it was set up. But the thing I just want to mention in terms of policy is that when you have ranked choice voting, uh, let's take in the, in the case where Sanders, Clinton, and um, Trump are all on the ballot, Bernie Sanders would get a large percentage of the vote. Even if he wasn't the ultimate winner, then if Clinton wins or if Gore um, had won and Nader had a large percentage of the vote, then they would have seen where some of the supporters that they had stood on issues. So Nader was really strong on opposing the death penalty. Gore was terrible on it. Mm -hmm. If Gore wins, or on trade, uh, same thing. On, on, on Nader was for fair trade rather than free trade. So instead of Nader getting 2% in Florida, Nader would have gotten 10 or 15% in this system. And then when Gore wins, he looks at where his support came. So the point of this is that it doesn't just eliminate all the problems you're talking about, but it gives a better policy signal to the ultimate winner because the voters have expressed where they're coming from in the first place, and it improves the democracy for that reason as well. Absolutely. Amen.